So I'm officially a parts changer. Unfortunately, the LMM Duramax is back in the shop. And before I get into this frustrating video, hopefully I can get something accomplished today. Maybe we might be able to get to a solution. I just want to give you guys a quick heads up. We just have weeks left to close out this contest, the 64 millimeter nine blade Ryan's diesel service turbo. We are giving it away on the channel. So there can only be one winner there. The second prize winner is going to win a Artie Diag brand new scan tool. And all you guys have to do is just go on the website, truckmasterdiesel.com. You guys can pick up a lift pump, a t-shirt, a hat, key tag, something like that. Definitely get entered in and I cannot wait to announce the winner. But let's talk really quickly here. I received this truck a couple months ago. The gentleman that owns it, he was pulling a trailer in another state. His truck went into limp mode and he was having fuel codes. To make matters worse, he had his family with him, but what he did is he removed his fuel filter, filled it up with diesel fuel, put it back on the housing. And he was good for a little bit until it came back again. Unfortunately, the guy was pulling a trailer. So when I talk about the truck being in limp mode, the truck won't even move under its own weight. It will a little bit. You have to put your foot all the way to the floor and it'll go, you know, about two or three miles an hour. But every single time the check engine light turns on for this code, the truck will go into limp mode unless I delete it. And then sometimes deleting it doesn't even fix the problem. So this would be the third time that this truck is back here in the garage for me to fix it. Check the fuel lines. They were all bent, frayed, rusted put brand new fuel lines on it. He was good to go for weeks until the problem came back again. I then removed the fuel valve from it and installed a nice PPE race fuel valve and it fixed the problem again. It came back three weeks later. And this is after the guy's been pulling trailers. The guy lives on a farm. He uses the truck for his livelihood. And unfortunately, it just happened again. So I told my buddy to go ahead and just go to the parts store and put a fuel filter head on that thing, a fuel filter housing. It might actually be defective. The O-rings may be bad. He did that, it fixed nothing. Of course, I checked the injector balance rates. They are perfect. Now, for some of you guys that don't speak this language, I understand it's really hard to follow what I'm trying to say here, but this is a fuel injection pump. They call it a CP3. They also have the CP4s for the newer trucks. These usually go on the Duramax and the Cummins. Sometimes this sensor, this regulator will actually go out and if you replace it, you won't have any issues. But for the most part, you might as well go ahead and just replace it. A job like that, remove and replace, you're looking at like $3,500. So we're just trying to get through some of the basics. The good news though is the fuel lines did need to get replaced. The truck absolutely needed that race plug. I think it was a really good option. Most guys usually do that with their trucks. I think the last thing you guys need on these diesel trucks is for you to lose your fuel rail pressure because most of these trucks are used for work. So amongst it being a CP3 fuel injection pump, being the big boy, it also could be very much the fuel sending unit, which I haven't looked at, and I'm really mad about that. So that's why I have it on the hoist. I'm gonna put my camera up there and see what I can see. But if it's all rusty and gross and crappy, then we're probably gonna go ahead and throw that in there as well. It may actually be sucking air from the actual fuel sending unit. And I think that's what's giving him his intermittent issues. Not only that, it doesn't have a lift pump. So before I check out this truck, I'm actually gonna phone a friend. I'm gonna call Ryan. Ryan's a diesel shop owner. He gets these trucks in constantly, Duramax, Power Stroke, Cummins. Or maybe he could just give me a good take on what I should look for while I have the truck already here because he needs it back tomorrow. The truck's in limp mode right now. I'm gonna put the sending unit in it, delete the codes. I almost guarantee you it's gonna fix the problem. I'm just worried it's gonna come back. But if it doesn't come back, then it was a sending unit. But who knows, we'll see how far we can get into this video. Definitely watch till the very end. And thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate all the support. Make sure you guys subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you're subscribed and you're not getting my videos, it's because YouTube unclicked your notification bell or your subscribe button. I'm getting a lot of reports of that. So do me a solid and do that for me. Definitely subscribe. So I have Ryan, the owner of Ryan's Diesel Service, located in North Prairie, Wisconsin. Actually, sort of close to Waukesha in Wisconsin. Uh, they do a lot of service on diesel repair as well as building some of the best turbos on the planet. They're actually co-located with Kodiak Truck. They rebuild transmissions, transfer cases, front differentials. So definitely check them out. I'll leave that link in the description. But how's it going, Ryan? Good, good. How about yourself? Very good. So you already know the deal with this truck. I'm sort of at a loss. What are some of the things and some of the steps that you guys do in order to check CP3s? So here's what I can tell you, especially on these LMM trucks. Um, the big thing, the technology wasn't always there as far as, well, we get a lot of customer concerns of, they'll say the truck will come in and say, oh, it has a uh, engine reduced power on the dash, but there's no other codes. Now, I know you had said you were getting some codes, but in the example of that, let's say that comes in, um, guys over the years have found that with the LDZ LMM trucks in particular, uh, the LDZs, usually they'll throw a code, but with the LMMs, when you get nothing, 
usually the first thing that most customers want us to try is just by going and putting a race plug in there. Um, I know you already did that, so we can kind of rule that out. Generally, the next step of if let's say, you know, that truck came in or they, we sent it back to the customer and the customer said, yep, nope, it's back on or it came back on. We'd re at that point in time and see, you know, is that rail pressure holding? Is it not? At that point in time, let's just hypothetically say, yes, it's holding. The next cheapest option for them would then be doing some sort of supply or lift pump on there. Obviously, we're big fans of the AirDog product. Um, at that point in time, we'd probably do like a Raptor, uh, some sort of Raptor pump. They could do a 165 if they wanted to, but we're, we are big fans of the Raptors, especially where we're at in Wisconsin. These trucks are really rusty. Everything it comes apart really difficult, and the less stuff that we need to disconnect off the sending unit, generally the better. So that'd be the next thing that we would do or the next approach we would do is put a lift pump on there. At that point in time, if let's say everything else checked out um, and we sent the truck back and they said, yep, the issue's still there, that's where the crossroads begins. Uh, the big common thing on these LMMs that we've seen is actually injector issues. You know the injector balancing rate can be fine. The return rate, however, can be too much. Um, and what we found in the past is that these injectors return too much fuel. We had a truck, this was way long time ago, many years ago, that we ran into uh, the customer he knew enough to be dangerous, and he basically shotgun blew the parts cannon at this truck, and CP3, lift pump, the whole nine yards ended up being, it was actually the injectors. Uh, we pulled the injectors, had them sent out, and that was the problem. So at that point in time, if let's say everything was still testing good, we're going to test the injectors, we're going to go, we, there's actually a test that you can do to test the return rates um, by disconnecting the return line. Uh, they got this little uh, vial deal uh, that you put all these lines to, you crank the truck over, etc. So that would be one thing that we would do. At that point in time, we can figure out then is it the CP3 or is it the injectors? Now, in your case where your pressures are all over the place, at that point in time, uh, we would want to really start looking very closely at the actual fuel lines, the sending unit, and that sort of thing. Now, I know you had mentioned that the sending unit's a little rusty, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So at that point, we would start looking into that. Now, we I can just say real world real life scenario we just had uh, i want to say it was either seven and a half or an eight that came through the shop here not that long ago um i don't know the exact details just because i don't deal directly hands-on with the day-to-day -day anymore but from what i gathered the truck had come in with like extended crank issues i know you're not point blank having that but what the, the tech ended up actually finding was that the sending unit was actually all rotted at the top even though it wasn't leaking out from full and even though you couldn't push your fingers through it it was still an issue we ended up putting a sending unit in it fixed all issues so that would be one thing that i would look at um if let's say at this point that doesn't fix it you said how many miles are on the truck uh, i think 120 or 150 but pretty low mileage do you know has this did the customer keep on just clearing the code and driving the truck yes or when this issue happened did he stop right away he stopped right away and then he had to put a he actually put a new fuel filter on it and um filled it with diesel fuel and then it got him going for a while until it came back again point it, at that point in time, I guess I'd be having a conversation with the customer of how far does he want you to go with it, um, whether he you know, plans on, hey, I want to pay you the labor to go and test the end of return rate do the return rate test on the injectors um, or if he just says, screw it, no, I just want a CP3 in the truck, he plans on keeping it a while. Per General Motors, I'd have to look it back up again. I believe the life expectancy of a CP3 was 180,000. I know on like the LB7 LOI trucks, it was 180,000 miles is what they deemed like normal life expectancy of what it was supposed to go to. Obviously, there's a lot of variables, fuel quality, fuel filter maintenance, how often does that change? It's going to go into obviously getting that long life out of it. But based on what you're telling me, I definitely think you're on the right track as far as inspecting that sending unit, going, looking at that kind of stuff and moving forward from there. Okay, I appreciate it, man. Um, now, the injector balance rates are actually at zero and one. So they're like okay. on the money. So either way, it could very well possibly still be the injectors. It could. Um, depending like on say, the return the rates. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, like you say, that one truck that I know that I, that was back when I was still wrenching on these trucks, the one that I dealt with where that guy threw all the parts at it, that one I remember for a fact. All his injectors were perfect. There was no issues. He's at idle, nothing, um, but he still had that extremely high return rate. And, and like I say, we ended up putting the injectors in it and fixed all his problems. And man, did that guy kick himself because he spent a lot of money on that truck throwing parts at it. And more than likely, it was the injectors the whole time. So I really appreciate that. That's very helpful. Um, one more quick thing here the fuel pressure regulator mm -hmm. on the CP3, 
I know that a yep. lot of guys will they're like a three hundred dollar part. I think Bosch, if you wanted to get it from a parts store like the, the same day or whatever, I, they're probably about one fifty or so. Very expensive units, very simple to install. Um, but do you think that could be the problem, or should if the customer wants to go for it? I mean, we might as well just do a CP three if that's the case. So yeah, that's what we find a lot of um, with the older trucks. Guys will roll the dice on these things. I we found, uh, especially here in the last couple of years, where guys will say, you know, screw it, just put a regulator in it. We'll see if usually they're complaining about a lopy idle. Uh, but in the newer trucks, you know, I still, even though it's you know. 07 and a half, I still consider that a new truck to me, or newer truck. Um, those trucks, we still find guys that if they're at that crossroads of they're going to pay us the labor to go and put a regulator in, they're going to pay for the regulator. Nine times out of ten, you're only a couple hundred bucks away from just getting a whole complete pump. Either way, we still got to strip you know, stuff down to get to it. Now are we stripping everything down like we would for a pump versus a regulator? No, but if you're only talking time for time, you're only talking a couple more hours, most guys are only just say, you know, screw it, let's just throw a whole pump at it and we don't have to worry about it at that point. Yeah, no, that's a good point because you got to tear basically everything off from the front top of the engine just to get to the regulator. So that's a really good point. Yeah, you're definitely, you're definitely getting down there, that's for sure, so... Man, oh man. So there's no real way to actually diagnose the CP3 unless it's unless you bench test it, unless you actually pull it out of the truck, I'm guessing. There are ways of, as I remember, I would have to go back again and look that back up. It's actually funny. We just had to do this on an LD7 last week, um, and I actually had to reference my notes from like 10 years ago from a training course because uh, it's been a hot minute since we ran into it. But in that case, we were actually we were able to isolate. Um, it was like 100 milliliters is what needed to be returned back. Um, like total and then there was basically steps that you would break it down um, on the LB7 side to isolate is it the injectors is it the CP3 um, so the tech ended up actually going through it we we said nope it's definitely it's got to be a CP3 issue and sure enough he actually finished the truck uh, the end of last week for uh, the holiday there and it fixed all the issues the truck runs great and we never had to touch the injectors so there are tests um, if you want that uh, when I get back later I can look that up for you and see if I can find that again if, if there is but I'm pretty sure there's a procedure for the newer trucks no hey I appreciate it man that's a lot of help um, I'm actually you're I'm on the right track here I think either way oh, yeah. that that fuel sending unit needs to get replaced it's all rusty yeah. crusty it's michigan it's just salt you know yeah. how it goes so oh, yeah. all right boss i appreciate all your support and help man hey by the way guys again i will leave the link in the description if you guys want to check them out ryansdieselservice.com they do a tremendous job and they really really support our channel but uh thanks again ryan not a problem have a good day see ya so after i just got off the phone with him i took my cell phone and went over the drive shaft underneath the truck and here's some pictures that you're seeing right now of what the fuel sending unit looks like we're going to go ahead and drop the tank right now and remove that thing and put a new one in. I'm going to have to run to the parts store and pick one up. They're about $400. They're kind of pricey, but uh, it needs to be replaced. So let's just go ahead and do it. I know I make this video look easy with the hoist. I know most of you guys can't do this at home, but uh, for me, it's such a blessing to have this hoist, man. It's so nice. As far as removing the fuel tank, it's pretty simple. If you have a hoist, obviously. I'm sorry. Just remove the three bolts that hold the fuel cap if you guys decide to do this. That way that'll slide down when you drop the tank. I don't have a jack stand, but basically all I'm gonna do is just take my cart, roll it up underneath there, remove the straps, and then uh, lower the fuel tank right on the cart. Pick the truck up, remove the fuel lines, get the fuel tank out of there, remove the sending unit, and put the new one. I'll show you what I'm doing. But let me go ahead and just skip the drama really quick. You're gonna remove the half inch in the three eighths. Of course, it's gonna get everywhere, but the big line's a half inch, small line is three eighths, which is right here. In order to do this, you're gonna locate your fuel cooler, which is to the rear of the vehicle on the driver's side. But this is 15 millimeters. There's two bolts that hold these straps on. Put that on just a little bit. Sometimes you don't get very lucky. The bolt will snap or, you know, That one is completely off. As you can see there, that's how long they are, 15 mil. All right, so now I'm gonna lower the truck and take that other bolt off. And, and the tank should start to slowly come down on the table, and then I'll go ahead and remove those straps. So basically you just have to fish this out through the frame in the bed and remove this sensor on the setting unit. And then you have to remove this. That's the only thing, oh, and the ground right here, ground strap. And 
I'm gonna pick the truck up and remove the tank. Unfortunately, I think it's like three quarters full, so this is pretty heavy. Let me show you guys the sending unit. It looks so bad. Oh boy. That doesn't look good. At this point right now, I'm gonna go ahead and just take some compressed air just so I can remove this. I don't wanna put any contaminants in that diesel fuel. But if we're throwing money at this truck, we might as well replace stuff that needs to be replaced, right? Another good news thing here. I like good news. We're gonna put a lift pump on this truck, so me replacing this and removing these lines already is gonna be very helpful when that lift pump comes in the mail. Oh, there we go, nice. All right. Yeah, not a chance in my life am I gonna get that out of there. I'm getting somewhere. Nice. All right, let's go ahead and get the new part on there. Very simple, just reinstallation. Get it back in the same exact orientation. So I have all the lines completely installed. I had to remove the part from the old sending unit that was right there, but we are completely done. I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing back up on the truck and fire it up and we'll see what happens. But either way, tank is installed. Let's go ahead and get it on the ground and fire it up. So I'm gonna take this thing on a pretty extensive test drive and hopefully nothing comes back, but so far we are good to go. So on the bottom right, fuel rail pressure it's at 4,500 at idle, and that's your desired. So that's where it's supposed to be. The desired is what the computer's saying it's supposed to be at, and this is what it's currently at. So as I increase the rail pressure, so as I accelerate, it should maintain the desire. So it should be the same, I mean, not exactly, but it should be the same number. And look at that. It is, that is awesome. But I'm not gonna even hold my breath, honestly. We're gonna have to put some miles on this truck to really know for sure if this fixed the problem. It's funny, this isn't even my truck. I'm just so frustrated with it. You know, once you think you have something figured out, you put so many hours into something, so much money, you think everything is good, and then no. But I guess the only thing that I'm worried about at this point is if he does end up going to limp mode and he can't drive the truck on the road while he's driving or pulling a trailer, especially with his family in there, and he has to get the truck towed. So if that happens again, I'm gonna say that it's gonna be a CP3. I'm not gonna make this a full series or anything, but if this happens again, I will definitely make another YouTube video on it. There's not a lot of upfront, close and personal videos like this where we're working through problems and hopefully finding a solution. Let's go ahead and give her a little WOT. Yeah, I saw 26,000 PSI at rail. Hey, that's gotta mean something, right? Another thing, do me a favor and subscribe to my other backup YouTube channel. It's called Truckmaster Garage. Believe it or not, YouTube just demonetized all of my YouTube videos. I'm kind of fighting with them back and forth on that. I don't know what's going on. So I'm basically doing these videos for free, which, you know, it is what it is. I know some of you guys are saying, oh, you're doing it for the money, but this is part of my job as well. I do YouTube as an income. So it really hurts when they cut off the monetization on the videos. That really sucks, especially with all the hours and money I put into this. I had a conversation with the owner about this truck and he's debating whether or not he wants to delete this truck or keep it stock so let me know in the comments guys should he delete his truck or keep it stock i get a lot of people in the comments bashing me saying see this is what you get for messing with your engine this is why you have so many issues this truck is completely bone stock and it's a complete mystery to me 
But that is it for this video today. Hopefully I don't break down on the way home. Head down to the comments below, click on that link, truckmasterdiesel.com. Get entered in for that turbo giveaway. Basically every $1 you spend on the website will get you guys one automatic entry and I will be closing this entry off on the 27th of this month. So hurry up. But thanks again. We'll see you on the next one. Stay tuned.